What I wanted to demonstrate is um, this, how this press works. I want to show you how to make a water, uh, a proper water filter. And this is a um, ceramic water filter uh, that I'm going to uh, create here. And uh, that's essentially the focus of the, the first talk. This is a bisque fired uh, filters made with clay and sawdust. Dry clay, dry sawdust, about 50-50. Uh, and when the sawdust burns out, uh, it leaves pores. Now the clay is naturally porous, but uh, the sawdust allows for more porosity and so the water can flow through. If you have uh, water that's contaminated with uh, microbes uh, and, and pathogens that might create things like cholera, E. coli, um, giardia, you can put that water into this filter. It will filter about one to three liters an hour and that water is rendered, uh, renders about 95% free of those, those contaminants. If we add a, tr a small amount of colloidal silver um, to the filter by brushing it on. Uh, usually it's a less than a gram with about 500 milliliters of water. That silver acts as a natural antimicrobial and will render inert the, approximately the, the remaining four, four and a half to five percent of the bad stuff that's in that water. So this is one of those approaches that allows us to have potable water or adequate access to clean water. A few years ago I uh, was working with some undergrad engineering students and I said look I have this dilemma. Here's the, here's the situation. We have this big press that's used conventionally to make these filters, but it's really tough to, to take with me on the road. Uh, can you make one that fits in a suitcase? They said, yeah. Can you make one that makes the same size filters? Yeah. Can you make one that um, uh, doesn't cost any money or costs as little as possible? And they said, well, wait, maybe. And they did it. This is the, the filter press. Um, it was collapsed earlier. I assembled this. And they made this out of repurposed materials, but also um, some of the materials I gave them, which was this bell, uh, the male and female molds here. Um, so I'll, I'll demonstrate how this, this works to make a filter. Usually, again, the filters are made on a full-size press, um, but this is a smaller uh, press. So this is both the prototype and um, the final product, and the only one in its existence. Cool thing about this is one person can operate it. Usually with those big presses, it, it's easier if two people operate it. Um, but one person can do very well. So this is a male mold. This is um, essentially um, very lightweight steel. This is, so we have this, this, this bell form. And what we're going to do is put the clay in the middle and we'll, we'll make the filter this way. So this is, this is the, 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 the metal. Uh, mold the bottom of the mold. I'm going to put this, thank you, put this plastic down as a release agent because the clay will stick to the uh, metal. It won't, doesn't like to stick to the plastic. And I have this bat. It has a bevel in it, approximately the same angle as the, the bell. And then I'm going to put this clay I'm going to put the second piece of plastic on and then I'll put the, this top part. What's interesting is that the original uh, traditional approach to um, these larger presses um, used concrete molds and then they moved to light, lighter weight um, metal molds. Uh, and so this is the same exact mold that one would find on a, on a larger press. Um, now, this is the part that sometimes gets tricky because you got to make sure both of these sides are latched down. And take this arm and tighten up the, the jack. And then with just a simple, this is a fun part, I like to say you have to get up to get down, right? You have to push this thing up in order for it to have resistance and push back down. At this point, I am going to release the pressure. There we go. All right, I'm going to tighten this back up. Now certainly this machine, this press, portable press, wouldn't necessarily work well for a, a proper production facility where you want, want to crank out lots of uh, uh, filters uh, in a day or in a week, but certainly to establish a facility in a community that needs 
clean water using this technology. We can use this press to create filters very quickly and create, uh, uh, give, us, give ourselves a baseline of, of not only the clay but the, how the filtration works. I'll lift this back up. Take the bell off. And there's our filter. Just takes a little bit of cleanup at this point. Again, I'm using my thumb just to pull some of this extra off, but I could certainly use, um, and this is what you would do in a, the production facility, would be to take a, a clay tool and to clean this up as well. And then, because this uh, bat is wider than the base, I simply lift, and there's the filter. I can lay this, place this down on a shelf in the studio or in the facility. Another worker would clean it up, smooth up some of the edges perhaps, stamp it with a date and a number so we can track the way that it, uh, pr uh, it operates. We let it dry, then we fire, we put it in the kiln, uh, we fire it to uh, about 866 degrees uh, C, and uh, what happens then is the sawdust burns out, which uh, then creates a more porous vessel uh, that allows the water to flow at a, at a more rapid pace than it would if uh, it wasn't as porous. Um, this is ready to make another filter. I could put plastic down, another bat down. We could continue to make filters as, as long as we had clay. So um, with one person, that was what, about a, a 10 minute time frame. With two people, you could move much more quickly. Uh, but the reason I wanted to demonstrate this to you is to show you in real time uh, what it takes to, to create a, a water filter. What if you designed houses? What if you designed shelters? What if you designed access to water as if you really cared about people getting it? Not that you cared about making money from it or that you were interested in fame or that you were just doing it to do it. What if you gave a damn about the situation? What if you cared in, in more direct ways? What would that look like in, in ways that would be affordable to people who need it, but also appropriate in terms of appropriate technology. The idea that uh, materials and practices and processes that allow for um, things like shelter and food and water access to happen do not um, uh, complicate a cultural set of rules and practices. Right? It's appropriate for the culture. It's appropriate for the situation. Uh, thinking about culture as the way we do things around here. Right? So does the, does the technology interrupt the way we do things around here? Does it pose uh, confusion? So this is the gentleman who invented, or is credited with coming up with the approach, uh, Dr. Fernando Mazarigas, uh, who's from Guatemala. And uh, as a first response to natural disasters, Mazarigas thought if we had this porous uh, vessel that allowed for water to flow through, that, that contaminated water uh, to flow through at a, at a fairly rapid pace, um, we might be able to produ produce adequate access to, to clean water, to potable water, um, after natural disasters. And so Mazarigas uh, then uh, was contacted by Ron Rivera. Ron was um, working with Potters for Peace at the time. And um, this was in the, the, the late 80s, uh, early 90s. And um, Ron learned the process and started setting up a water filter production facility through Potters for Peace. Met Ron Rivera a number of years ago at a conference, and uh, several months late, after I met him, he passed away. He was working in Nigeria to help a community set up a water filter production facility so that they wouldn't contract malaria and would not die from malaria. Ron came back from that trip and died from a very rare and difficult strain of malaria. So he gave his life so that others could have clean water. And um, whenever I give a presentation, I always uh, think of that very special moment meeting Ron. But the idea is that um, it's possible for this technology to be passed along to folks so that they can use it um, to, to move uh, throughout world, the world and through, through communities to, to, uh, to help other, other people. This is a cross section. This is a drawing that Manny did of uh, the filter inside the receptacle. You see the addition of a spigot and a lid. 
And these are two important components. You need a spigot to get the water out and a lid to keep hands and other things entering into the, into the filter. Uh, contamination is, is a big issue, right? These filters, as you see here, if they were sitting in a count, on a counter in uh, a kitchen, you can put anything in there. You, your hands can touch them. External uh, things could touch them. And, and you can contaminate the water. Even the water that is, is flowing through um, uh, can get contaminated. So uh, a lid is necessary. I don't know if you can hear, but this one is dripping quite loudly now that the water is flowing. We uh, have some dirty water that we were using earlier. And um, uh, we filled these uh, filters up. I'm going to lift this one up so you can see it. Okay? You can't see the cross section. This is the cross section. Here's the spigot. I don't have the lid, but I'll lift this up. You'll notice the bell shape, and you should see the water dripping uh, from the filter. You see that? And if you come up uh, later after we give this little chat, you'll be able to see the clean water that's in there. So this is a, a point of use water filter. It's placed in the point in which it will be used in the home, usually in a kitchen. And you, uh, the idea is that you would fill it up in the morning, or in the evening, I'm sorry, before you go to sleep. It will filter through the night, and in the morning you have water uh, for cooking and drinking. You fill it up again sometime during the day, and then you have another uh, batch of water um, in the evening. So again, point of use water filters. These filters, again, the technology is the same, the idea is the same, but because clay and needs are different in different locations, various organizations have set up facilities uh, under different names, but using the same technology, the same idea. Because the need for clean water is a global need. The right to wa access to water is a basic human right. So this little girl and her, uh, the other two uh, children in the image are drinking water like they do every day. I can go right to that water fountain down the hallway and get a drink of water, or my water bottle is here somewhere. I can drink out of that. You all, many of you have water bottles. This is the same water that you see in the background. This water is the same water where the cows have defecated, uh, where people have thrown away um, whatever it is they're throwing away in that water. This little girl is in Honduras. This gentleman is getting water for his family as well. And uh, that box has a little opening on the face, on the plane facing us. He reaches his hand and puts a few coins in there, and the water comes out of that long tube. Water's been sitting in some sort of receptacle reservoir underneath. He fills up the containers in the back of his truck, and then drives those containers home. Then has to figure out how to get the water into his house. Then has to figure out how to get, make sure the water is clean and safe to drink. This gentleman is in South Texas, outside of Laredo. Half a million people do not have utilities, paved roads, and housing that's up to code in South Texas. From El Paso to Brownsville and 150 miles north, that green swath that you see in that map, that's South Texas. Half a million people. They don't have ad adequate access to clean water either. And so my colleague at Texas A&M, Oscar Munoz, uh, is, is the uh, director of the Colonius program and works uh, with communities along that, along that region. Social practice and public pedagogy linking those to this notion of inter intentionally disruptive responsibility. Social practice being a term that um, grows out of a number of moves in contemporary art where we, uh, has been theorized by people like Claire Bishop and uh, Pablo Helguera and others uh, to think about um, the way in which artists or art, um, artistic practices intersect with social issues and conventions from other disciplines to make positive change or to enact change in, through intentional modes. Public pedagogy, very much like what we did um, this, after, or this morning, we were out essentially <laughs> on the sidewalk, or we're on the, the patio that overlooked the sidewalk, uh, mixing clay and sawdust in preparation for making water filters. And people stopped and said, what are you, what? What are you doing? Right there, you have developed a relationship, this interchange. By asking a question and responding in this back and forth and back and forth, there's some learning that goes on in both directions. And talking to folks about uh, the water filters through a public forum in a public space um, uh, is one form that we might consider public pedagogy. When I moved to 
to uh, Penn State, I decided to put a name to these performances, Collaborative Creative Resistance. I mean, Larry and I were talking about titles, and sometimes the title's enough to tease and pull folks in. But the idea of, of, of how might we collaboratively work together to resist those hegemonic forces or to, to disrupt uh, what others might find acceptable. So uh, with a small grant from the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, I did a performance in front of the Palmer Museum of Art. So there's a proximity to the museum, art museum, so maybe it's more art-like because it's closer to the museum. I'm not necessarily saying that, but it was a wonderful open space that allowed for the middle of campus to, um, uh, to stumble upon. And I was, it was a, a Friday afternoon in the middle of April, set up the press, started making filters, people stopped by, Students in art education and in, in, in the School of Visual Arts volunteered to sieve uh, sawdust and to mix the clay. Although I knew this would probably happen, I didn't count on it happening to the degree that it did. In the background of this image and in the very foreground, you probably see people who are a little younger than what you might expect to see on college campuses. These are children who came from the local daycare center on campus and from the local elementary schools. The daycare folks knew I was going to do it because I had talked to them, but the people, the kids from the elementary schools, their teachers and the kids thought they were going inside the museum to see art. But when they got off the bus and they saw this guy with the fedora wedging clay and using this big guillotine looking machine in the middle of campus, they would have, they'd rather stay outside and talk to that guy. We had wonderful conversations about adequate access to clean water. Former student Sam Bachman, who is a ceramic artist, a dual degree, um, studio art and art education. You can have class anywhere. You can engage education anywhere. You can have learning anywhere. Education is a relationship. Teaching and learning is a, is a relationship. It's ne negotiated between multiple parties. And there's as much learning going on from whoever thinks they might be the teacher as there is from folks who might initially think they're, they're the learner. Everyone in that relationship is learning and teaching simultaneously.